Hello, coaches. Welcome back to another episode of Coach Better Spotlight. Today, I'm chatting with Tanya Gilchrist, information literacy consultant and experienced literacy and technology coach. In this spotlight clip, we talk about a common challenge many coaches face, imposter syndrome. Oftentimes, when coaches step into the role, they suddenly begin to question their expertise or experience. It's something we all deal with. Tanya shares her strategies to move forward and embrace a growth mindset as a coach. In the full length podcast, we also talk about her experience working with so many different schools around the world and what she's learned about building a coaching culture in any school context. To hear the full episode, subscribe to Coach Better wherever you get your podcasts. If you enjoy today's episode, you will love all of the resources and professional learning experiences we're curating for you here at Aduro Learning. Check out our website to see all of our latest offerings at adurolearning.com. Welcome back to another episode of Coach Better. Today, I'm excited to be chatting with Tanya Gilchrist. And we actually met recently when we were both in Singapore doing some work at Stanford American School. And I'm really excited to hear a little bit more about all of Tanya's amazing work. So Tanya, welcome so much to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to do this. It is my pleasure. And I know a little bit about your background as a teacher, as an educator, but can you tell us a little bit more about your history, your career history as an educator? Sure. So I started teaching in the U.S. Um, I was definitely one of those people who kind of always wanted to be a teacher. I think it was third grade, I'm I'm pretty sure, when I decided I want to be a teacher and it actually stuck and that's what I stuck with. I studied education in university and then started my career teaching in Virginia, uh, which is where I was from. I was born and raised in Virginia. So I started there. Surprisingly, I started in middle school. I actually studied, I know, it's my favorite now too, (laughs) but I actually studied um, early, like elementary education, and then um, I was a December graduate, and the position that was open was middle school, and so I was like, well, I'm terrified, but it's a job. I'm going to do it, so I did it, and I basically, I almost never looked back. In my heart, I definitely never looked back. I fell in love with it, and I stuck with middle school for years. And then uh, when I met my now husband, he's from Texas, so I moved from Virginia to Texas. And when I went down there to teach, the positions that were available were in elementary. So I went back to elementary for a few years, and of course I loved that too. I spent a few years in the early years. That was great. I mean, I came to discover I just love teaching and working with kids because every age level, I was like, yo, this is great too in this way and that way. But middle school still always stayed like in my heart. Um, And so then when I had the chance, I moved back into middle school. Um, And then I actually started working as a technology integration coach at that time. So I taught, um, I think, another year in middle school and then and then started coaching um, in middle school classrooms. And that was a ton of fun. I absolutely loved coaching and the whole relationship side of things with colleagues and teachers and working together as a team. Um, that was great. Um, I still had a few classes as well at the same time, which I really liked that mix um, of having some classroom time and some coaching time. And I think it helped my coaching relationships as well. Kind of that feel of like, that, you know, you really do get this too, because you're yes. still living it. Um, so it was really nice. And then, um, yeah, that's about the time that I uh, started to think about teaching overseas. So all of that was still happening in the US. Um, and I, I've talked about this before on a few podcasts, but it's still like, you know, you don't, you don't always like to go to the negative. But the reality of the situation is that, uh teaching had become very, very standardized in the U.S., and it was basically sucking the joy out of everything. And again, I was the type of person who always wanted to be a teacher. Um, I loved it. I loved working with the kids, but I did not love having absolutely no autonomy, and I did not love kind of needing to do things that I knew weren't best for kids. 
right. and that weren't really about learning. I'd always been an inquiry-based teacher, um, a workshop teacher. So all of that just was like in my veins and this idea of like these canned, like every sixth grade teacher is going to be teaching this lesson on this right. day was really hard. Um, and so I kind of hit a low where I was literally Googling, what else can I do mm -hmm. with my teaching degree? <laughs> um, which I never thought I'd be doing, but that's, that's what happened. And that's right. where I kind of stumbled, you know, down the Google rabbit hole. I sort of discovered this whole world of the IB and international education and that I honestly really didn't know existed. Um, at that point in my life, I really only knew about people teaching overseas with like the Department of Defense or teaching like, um, you know, solely English, like as an additional language, like yep. TESOL or something. So it was like this whole new world. And my husband and I talked about it. And we were like, well, let's, let's do it. And as I've come to discover, it seems to be true for almost every elementary, uh, elementary international educator. Um, we said, we'll do it for two years and then come back. Totally not what happened um, because we fell in love with it. And now I feel like almost everyone I talk to says the same thing. They're like, me too. We were just going to go for two years. It was going to be this fun, like, uh, adventure. Um, but that's not how it was at all. We fell in love with it and we've stayed overseas ever since. So we've been in uh, Thailand and Japan and now we're in Albania. Um, and over the course of those years, I continued doing some teaching uh, in middle school in the MYP and then also some work as a coach, as a literacy coach. And then that's taken me to today where that grew and I started actually consulting part time as a literacy consultant with uh, Aaron Kent Consulting. And then this school year, I moved into that full time. So now I'm out of the classroom and not actually tied to one school. I'm just visiting schools all over the world to help them with literacy, to grow their literacy work. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. During this conversation and the um, ex examples you're giving, it also makes me think about a couple of other conversations I've had recently about the uh, feeling of imposter syndrome that like as a coach and sometimes as a teacher too, right? As a school leader, as a consultant, like it happens to all of us that you have this, these moments of doubt where you're like, oh, how did I get here? Why am I in this position? <laughs> like, I'm not qualified for this. And I'm just curious, is that, like, tell me, do you have any connections to that? Have you seen that in practice? Like, is there anything you, does that resonate with you, that concept of imposter syndrome? Oh, absolutely. Like, I think 100%, <laughs> like when you were talking, I'm like, yes. <laughs> um, especially, especially this year, you know, my work as a consultant, um, and in our whole team's work. So working, I'm working with Aaron Kent Consulting and now we're, this whole team is growing. Some, some are working part-time, I'm full-time. Um, more will be full-time next year. Like the work is just exploding, which is wonderful. But you do then find yourself in this new role, um, doing something full-time, um, doing something like so much more at like a faster pace than, than you've ever done before. And so I definitely have moments where I'm, you know, in the hotel room and I'm like, what? Like, you know, especially if it's the start of a new visit. Yeah, exactly. Like, whoa, like, um, you know, pinching yourself almost. And I think um, for me, like there, I think, I think every person would have moments of self doubt where you kind of feel like, like, can I do this? Should I be doing this? You know? Um, and just feeling maybe a little overwhelmed um, and again, because every school is different. So I think for me, I'm now thinking of it as a consultant, but I think for the coaches out there listening, like for them, every teacher they work with is different. And so there are going to be moments when you don't know the answer. Um, and you don't, you know, that you don't know, like a teacher might be looking for something and you don't know, but I think that's a beautiful thing to actually lean into. Like instead of feeling, um, like not worthy or um, having that self-doubt instead being like, what a beautiful opportunity to learn because like, let's practice what we preach here. Like I definitely believe that learning is lifelong and that we always have room to grow and I've never want to stop growing and learning. So when that happens, being able to be like, Oh wow, you know, I've, I've never thought about that. Like if, whether it's someone asks a question or, you know, just being open and genuine of like, I've never thought about that. What a cool thing to study. <laughs> like we should really study that or start researching into that because that could be really powerful. Um, but being honest, I think is number one. And then the other thing is, I think when we feel those moments of self doubt, really paying attention to what's, what's happening. Like, what are the, um, 
what, what do the results say instead? Because a lot of times we get into our own head and we think like, oh, I don't know. Or like, should I even be doing this? But then when you look at the students of the teacher you've been coaching with or, or you talk with that teacher, they're like, I'm so glad you're here and thank you so much. And so you realize, oh, wow, like I really have made a positive difference. Or for me as a consultant, when we do like some reflective piece at the end or like a gallery walk of our learning or something and you see or people are messaging you afterwards, like so excited and so inspired to go into their classroom and do things, then it's like, oh, wow, like, you know, none of us are perfect. And I still have a ton to learn. And I always will, but I'm making a positive difference. And, and to just look at those results when you feel like, like you're not worthy of something like instead, instead of listening to that, like mm -hmm. critic um, in your head, instead, let, let's look at the things that are tangible and like, see the difference that you're making. Um, because if, if that's your, if you're in the role of a coach or a consultant or a teacher in the classroom, like you're doing positive things, you're having a positive impact. So looking for those results instead of just letting that overwhelmed cri critic voice um, get to you. You mentioned the same two things that I always talk about and I love your phrasing is so much nicer than the way that I phrase <laughs> it. But I love this concept of that not knowing the answer being a beautiful thing to lean into. I always try to say, can you be transparent about your thinking in that moment in time? Like, you don't need to hide what you don't know. It's okay to say, oh my gosh, I've never thought about it that way. Like, let me either, let's look at it together or let me do some research for you or, you know, whatever the appropriate next step is. But it's okay not to know everything. And in fact, in not knowing everything, you're modeling the growth mindset that you want for the teacher to have. So if you constantly have every answer, you can think about that as being pressure on the teacher to constantly have every answer. Every so answer. Mm -hmm. Opening that up for them, which I think is like Huge. a really nice way to approach it. Um, mm -hmm. And then also your point about looking at the data and, and listening to the feedback that you get from teachers or in whatever context you're working in. And that made me think about, I was talking to somebody the other day and I was like, what about if every day you just wrote down one positive thing you heard today about your work? and you just stuck that in a little journal, or you put it somewhere, and anytime you have those thoughts, you could just kind of flip back through, because we never yeah. save that kind of stuff, right? You get tons yeah. of positive feedback, but what do you do with it? It goes in one ear and out the other, and the negative feedback comes in and rattles it around stays. forever, right? <laughs> yeah, totally, no. Both of those. Yeah, and I love that idea that you said of like just writing it down and keeping those like in a journal, like some sticky notes somewhere or something like, and then at those times when you are feeling exceptionally overwhelmed, like opening that back up and looking at it, like how powerful that could be. And you, you know, can that make that into whatever you want, right? You could take photos, you could, it could be digital, it could be handwritten, whatever yeah. it is, you know, you could take pictures of an experience you had in the classroom that was so, was such a fun day. And all it takes is just a quick reminder to kind of jolt you out of, you know, whatever moment of insecurity you're having. Oh, that's right. Yesterday, this great thing happened. But today is a whole right. new day. Like, I don't need to worry about whatever's going on right now. So I think, I think yeah. that's a fascinating aspect of being in a coaching role. And I think it applies to school leaders and teachers just the same. But all of us have those moments of self-doubt, but we don't really talk about them a lot. And so I think having the opportunity to acknowledge that it's reality, it's okay, and we can we have strategies to work through it is really important. Yeah, I think what you just said is really important too about how we don't talk about it. Like because there is this idea out there that, you know, it's it's almost like we feel this pressure that we do need to be perfect, but there is no perfect. And actually right. imperfections are really great. That's where the learning's happening. So yeah. that's the magic, you know. So I think um uh that feels really important too to to lift up and and how, you know, kind of tying into that same vein how you said you know, for the teachers you're working with, or whoever you're working with, the schools you're working with, the students, whatever your role is, that they see you as a learner too, because you genuinely are. Mm -hmm. And so not trying to hide that, not trying to act like you know everything. Um, in fact, acting like you know everything can actually do some damage, you know, whether we intend to or not. So instead, um, really living that, that role that we often talk about of being a lifelong learner and being open-minded, being curious, um, letting, letting people see that I think helps build the relationships. And again, it's, it's all about relationships. Like that's what it comes back to. So, um, whether it's relationships with a kid or a colleague or school leaders or whoever, when they can see like, Oh, you know, like 
you're just like me. Like we don't have all the answers, but we can grapple with this together. Like we can learn together and build something new. Um, that's so much more powerful than just coming and being like, uh, here's everything or I'll even pretend like I know everything just to feel like I'm more of an expert or something yes. but actually like let's be an expert at learning you know yes. <laughs> because that's that's what it's about so and that's that coaching culture that we're all trying to build right that coaching culture yeah. is a culture of growth mindset of being willing to be vulnerable be willing to share being willing to try something new and collaborate with somebody else and it's really hard to build that kind of culture when all of the people that you're supposed to be vulnerable with are perfect you know yeah, exactly. Thanks for watching today's episode. Don't forget to check out EduroLearning.com for more great learning opportunities and connect with us on social media at Eduro Learning to stay up to date with everything we share.